Yes, you can go ahead. You can start, inshallah. Okay, great. All right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Sumaya Zama. Uh, many of you, of course, know me. However, I've been on a couple of the uh, previous calls, and I'm noticing there's a lot of people coming on from like different parts of the state, not just the Sharon community, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, welcome. If you're not part of the Sharon community and you don't know who I am, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. I'm going to leave all my contact information if you have any like follow-up questions or anything um so I'm like, everyone my name is Samaya um, Zama so, um, yeah, like I you, said my name is Samaya Zama everyone. formal introduction but before we jump sort of right into um what it is I'm going to talk about today I just wanted to take a minute to do a quick breathing exercise so you know, at noon during the session um, about mental health, which was amazing, um, I noticed that someone had asked about breathing exercises and um, just wanted to start with that before we really jumped in. Um, so if I could get everyone to, I, I can't see who's here, but um, just in front of your computer or wherever you are to um, just be very still and calm. And if you can, you know, close your eyes. Um, and I'm going to count to three. And if we can all breathe in for three, hold it and breathe out for four. All right. Breathe in for three. Three, two, one. Breathe in for three. Breathe in for three. Three, two, one. Hold it. Breathe out for four. Four, three, two, one. One more time. Breathe in for three. Three, two, one. Hold it. And breathe out for four. Four, three, two, one. One more. Breathe in for three. Three, two, one. And hold it. Breathe out for four. Four, three, two, one one awesome so i hope that was helpful for people i know you know the quarantine has caused a lot of anxiety i know for myself um for people that i know for my friends my family i mean it's a really really crazy time and i don't like to sort of sugarcoat that i know it's difficult and what we're about to talk about is a little bit difficult so i just wanted to make sure that i was creating the space for people to sort of unpack a lot of that and maybe like allow ourselves to breathe a little bit easy um inshallah all right um i wanted to make this as interactive as possible that's incredibly difficult to do over zoom but um i just like folks to you know chime in whenever they want to feel free to ask a question um or leave a comment on how you feel about any sort of thing or even suggestions um and we'll we'll go from there inshallah all right um, I'm just going to offer folks to uh, say their name, their favorite quarantine snacks, and how they're feeling right now. So if you want to go ahead in the chat box, I'll give an example. So my name is Samaya. My favorite quarantine snack is, I've been drinking this TikTok coffee, so I'm going to say that. And I'm feeling great. So I'm going to enter that into the chat, and if folks can just continue to do that while I talk, that would be great, just so I have a feel for who's around, and we can make this as interactive as we want to. Awesome. Um, so again, you know, moving into who I am, what I do, uh, my name is Samaya Zama. I'm the Director of Community Advocacy and Education at the Massachusetts Chapter of CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations. We're the largest civil rights advocacy organization for Muslims in the United States. Um, and my work in particular is with young Muslims and the Muslim community in general. Um, and so what does that look like? What does the protection of civil rights look like? What does caring about society look like in the middle of a quarantine and sort of this coronavirus that is like impacting all of us? 
Um, you know, that's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, you know, we're in quarantine. We are being mindful of social distancing. Hopefully, many of us are. I'm actually very proud of the Muslim community for continuing to do that. Um, but alhamdulillah, like we have been so good about caring for each other, not getting each other sick, um, remaining at home for as long as we need to be. Um, but there are some folks in society who are not immune compromised or might also be immune compromised, but folks who are not immune compromised, folks who are not elderly, that we should also be thinking a lot about. Um, and so I'm sort of going to divide my talk into three groups of people that have been adversely impacted by coronavirus and by the quarantine. Perhaps folks that we don't typically think about or aren't thinking about in this moment. Um, and so just want to like reorient ourselves, redraw ourselves to who those folks could be. Um, and so the first group of people that I'd like to talk about is the Asian American community. A huge chunk of us Muslims who are also Asian identifying. Um, sorry, going to mute this. Okay. A huge chunk of us are Asian American identifying. Uh, many of us are not East Asian. Uh, many of us tend to be South Asian. Um, but however, many um, Muslims are East Asian identifying. And so, you know, the really obvious one right now has been, you know, what is the impact on the Asian American community? Um, I'm going to start off with a little <laughs> tidbit. I'm sure you guys can all relate. Um, you know, when coronavirus stuff st first started breaking out, out, um, I noticed, you know, my family and my friends and folks that I knew getting a lot of WhatsApp forwards. Um, I'm sure like younger people can relate. Maybe your parents were getting WhatsApp forwards about Asian Americans <laughs> um, and about how, you know, this is a virus that started in China. And, you know, this is something we should be careful about. And there were all these like weird like theories about why it started in China and um, what any of this has to do with Chinese Americans. And, you know, there was a lot of blame going around that I noticed. Um, and I think, you know, that was something that I became sensitive about that I felt like, okay, you know, like as Muslims, we do not like when we are stereotyped, you know, we feel like we are blamed for a lot of things that are not our fault. Um, and, you know, a lot of it goes around every time there is a school shooting. We're like, you know, if this person was Muslim, they'd call it a terrorist act. And, you know, whenever we do something, it's called terrorism. Um, you know, this is a really valid concern that a lot of Muslims have. And, you know, we don't like to be grouped up as like one sort of group of people. Um, and so I had immediate concerns because I was like, you know, this is, this is something that we care about, you know, as a civil rights organization, we care about combating stereotypes. We care about fighting for the rights of our brothers and sisters in Islam. Um, and so what does that mean when we as Muslims are placing the blame on something that is, it's going to impact all of us, right? Like it's going to, it has, it's spread all over the world. In every country of the world, you know, there's reported cases. And so it's impacting the Asian American community. And so how are we sort of monitoring, monitoring our social interactions with the Asian community? Um, I have a friend who works for an Asian American um, organization, and he has said that their hate crimes have spiked you know, unfortunately. And so that's something we want to be intentional about. We want to be thinking about when hate crimes spiked in the Muslim community after the 2016 election, that was something that, you know, us as CARE, we were thinking deeply about, you know, in response to 9-11, in response to the election, in response to anything that happens, we feel very cautious about the well-being of our loved ones and our friends and our families. And so, you know, it's something that I want to draw attention to. I want us to have open conversations about things like that. And I think there is a way to talk about the virus and, you know, the origins of the virus or whatever you want to call it without being xenophobic. 
Um, and so that is something that I'm thinking a lot about. Okay, I'm just reading through the comments. Favorite snack is Kit Kat. Favorite snack is pineapples. Dates, okay, we have a Sana food in there. Dates and tea, okay, awesome. Um, shout out to the people who shared. Um, if you didn't share, it's totally fine. I just was curious. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, and then moving forward, you know, I think the defense around Asian Americans also comes in when we think a lot about um, who we are supposed to be protecting and what our religion calls on us to do in the face of like ethnic diversity. You know, at the one of the things I love the most about the Sharon Masjid is the ayat that is written across the front door. You know, we have divided you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. Um, that is something that is so, it's at the heart of this community in particular. And so I want to make sure that we're checking each other and we're reminding each other that this is not only just like a liberal talking point or like a woke kind of take. No, this is like what Islam calls on us to do. It calls on us to recognize our diversity and to respect that and to not blame, place blame for something that really can happen to any ethnic group, right? This is a virus, I mean, and it has. It has originated from different parts of the world. Um, but at the end of the day, like we are Bunny Adam, like we are children of Adam and we are in this together, you know? So that's something I want us to think about. The second sort of group of people that I want us to draw our attention to are incarcerated folks. Um, and that means folks who are um, in prison, folks who are in jail, uh, people who are packed in tight vicinities. Um, you know, I think this is an issue we don't talk about at all is decarceration. So trying to come to a place in society where there are less people who are locked up in jail um, and in prison. Um, and as Muslims, but particularly as American Muslims, this is something that we should be caring a lot about, you know the scale of incarceration, the scale in which Muslim Americans are, I mean, um, I'm sorry, Americans are locked up is the highest out of any country in the world. And not by two or three times, but by a lot. Um, you know, I encourage you guys to look into this issue. I encourage you guys to look into why that is, what the origins of that are. Um, I think that's a whole different talk. Um, and inshallah, if we have time, like I can answer some of those questions about that. Um, but there's a lot of people who are wrongfully convicted. There's a lot of people who are locked up for no real reasons who are very much at risk for catching coronavirus, right? So if you can imagine the way our prisons and our jails are set up, there are people who are very much in close proximity to each other. And you might say, you know, well, none of them are leaving the jail. How are they going to get it? Once there's a guard there or anyone who works there, that gets it like it's pretty much over for the entire population you know i encourage you guys to look into what's happening at rikers i mean that's like a prison that um has a very bad history of being very abusive to um folks who are locked up and so there are a growing number of cases happening and it's going to become like wildfire so i want us to be thinking about that as well also, feel free to ask any questions if you guys have any or if I'm talking too fast. You know, I'd love to, to give clarification or, or talk more about these issues because they are very heavy. Um, and the third sort of group of people I want to talk about is uh, folks who are homeless. You know, folks who do not have a home. Um, you know, Boston has one of the highest rates of homelessness in the country. Um, I'm thinking a lot about people who cannot socially distance. Like there are literally people who do not have that option. Like their space in which they live is shared with other people. Um, and so if you are tuning into this from your own home, you know, just for a moment, you know, send a prayer to those who do not have that, you know, take a moment to sit in that gratitude because it really is a blessing you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and
And so I know we're running short on time. I think I have like 20 more minutes or 25 more minutes. I wanted to like shift to a Q&A and make time for that. Um, so I'll just move through a little bit quickly. Um, and so what are the four things that we can sort of be doing right now that we're in quarantine? Um, you know, I was listening to Imam of the Rahman yesterday and he talked about how this quarantine is kind of like our own Ithaca. Like, you know, the last 10 days of Ramadan when you were in Ithaca and you're really, you know, deeply immersed in prayer and thought and gratitude and, and just worship. Um, in a lot of ways, what we're experiencing now is like a mandatory Ithaca where we're all in this together and we're all sort of in a state of trying to figure out who we want to be at the end of this. Um, and so the two sort of questions that I'm posing to folks is, one, who do you want to be after this quarantine? What are the things that you can do now to become that person at the end of the quarantine? The second thing that I encourage folks to think about is what is the society that you would like to see post quarantine, right? Who would, who, what kind of society do you imagine seeing, um, you know, after that, all of that. Um, and so we can begin the work that needs to be done on those two fronts, both the individual and the society. We can do that work now while we are, given this time, right? There are no distractions. There's, you know, work from home, school from home. Um, and so the four things that I encourage folks to do, the first one, make dua, pray, like make dua, like make dua for people who have less, make dua for folks who, you know, are, are you know, Asian American, who both have to deal with the fact that this illness could touch their lives, just like any one of us and also have to deal with the fact that they might experience a hate crime. Prayers are always, you know, something that you want to be thinking a lot about. Um, that is the most powerful thing that you can do. Praying for incarcerated folks um, and praying for folks who are homeless. Um, and so just to dive a little bit into that portion, um, you know, we always say, like, you should make dua, like, you should pray, you know, it seems like a common sense sort of thing. One thing I've been working a lot on is being intentional about writing down those prayers. So I have, like, a journal with all of my duas in them. Um, whenever anyone says, you know, make dua for me, I, I, I make a point to write them down. I make a point to write down the name of the person, what specifically I am asking for, and crafting the language around that dua in a very intentional way. Um, you know, we, we know that Allah loves when we are very mindful and ask in a very beautiful way. Um, and so I have some examples <laughs> I wrote down of that. You know, if, you're, if you are making dua for folks who are incarcerated, you know, saying like, Ya Allah, only you can grant freedom to those who are not free. Only you can do that. Ya yeah, Allah, please free all of the wrongfully imprisoned people in the world, right? So making sure that you are asking for that very specifically. Um, I encourage you all to do that. The second thing that I encourage folks to do is to center the most oppressed people in your conversations. You know, I notice I'm like sitting with my parents a lot now. I'm, you know, we're all sitting together for dinner. We don't really have an option. <laughs> it's not like you can be like, yeah, I'm out with my friends. Like, no, we're all in like a very close vicinity to each other. Um, and so I encourage you all to have conversations in which you are centering people who are being very negatively impacted by this virus. So, you know, it can be very easy to say, you know, I just want this quarantine to be over. Like, can it just be over by now? Yes, that, those are valid feelings. Like, we all feel that way. Um, but how can we reorient this, these conversations to have a depth to them that kind of allows us to express our empathy and allows us to open up for deeper conversations, right? Um, and... The, sec the third thing that I would talk about is 
actually just moving back back to centering the most oppressed people in your conversations it is an election year <laughs> um there's a lot going on in the world besides this quarantine and there was a lot going on before the quarantine um and so recentering that as well so what does you're seeing all these social implications happen as a result of coronavirus how does that shift the attitudes or the feelings you have about politics and policies? How does that shift the attitude that you have about people who are running for office? So, you know, if universal health care now suddenly is something you care about, what do different candidates say about the issues that you care about? Um, and it is in times of trial and tribulation and challenge that we figure out how we feel about those that care for us or claim to care for us, right? So if someone is saying, you know, I'm going to promise you all of these different things, you know, how does that look like in a world of COVID-19? How does that look like when you're seeing incarcerated folks? Will you vote for someone that, you know, encourages us to lock people up and lock more people up? Or are you voting for someone who is encouraging the opposite for us to close down our jails and for us to really think about rehabilitation in a better way, if that makes sense. Um, so I encourage you guys to continue to have those conversations. Um, and also I would say like, you know, email me if you'd like to get more involved in what specifically we're working on. There's actually a bill being passed through the Massachusetts State House, directly talking about decarceration. And so if you'd like to sign on, I'm gonna like link that uh, below, you know, encourage your parents, your friends, if you, if you can't sign on, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, that is something that is very direct that you can do. Just reading through my notes. Um, and then the final thing that I would say is donations to folks who are working on a lot of these issues. You know, like I work in the nonprofit world for civil rights work. You know, our jobs have not stopped. We are still working. We are still working on the missions that our organizations call upon us to do, right? So, um, that is something that I want us to think about um, is, you know, what are the organizations that are working on a lot of these issues um, that you can be supporting? And I have three examples for all three sort of groups of people that I've talked about so far. Um, for the Asian American community, there's this amazing nonprofit, It's Local, Boston-based, the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center. Um, they are an organization that is very much like CARE in a lot of ways, but for the Asian American community. Um, and so I, their website is bcnc.net. I'm going to share this in the chat just so I don't forget for folks. Um, and I'll go ahead and read their, what they do, their mission statement. Um, so the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center empowers Asians and new immigrants to build healthy families, achieve greater economic success, and contribute to thriving communities by providing a broad range of innovative and family-centered programs and services to more than 13,000 children, youth, and adults every year. The mission of the BCNC is to ensure that the children, youth, and families we serve have the resources and support that they need to achieve greater economic success and social well-being. So social well-being, you know, what is that? They have a lot on their plate right now, if you really think about it. Like, what does it mean to ensure social well-being for Asian Americans when it feels like almost the entire world is in a state where they are placing a lot of blame? Um, and what does that look like? You know, as Muslims, we can relate to that. As a Muslim, I can relate to that, right? Like deciding to wear a hijab after 9-11, what is that? What has that meant for so many of us? We know what that feels like. Um, and so it is about coming together as a community and about making sure that we are not sort of playing into that trap that shaitan like lays for us where we are 
placing that kind of blame on another person. Um, so that's the first organization that I would encourage folks to think about uh, supporting or look into if you cannot donate money, which is totally valid. Um, look into volunteer opportunities. You know, if you're one of my um, Muslim youth leadership program, young people, like you know that one thing we care a lot about is folks who, um, like having our young people volunteer for different organizations and to tap into a lot of that stuff, um, you know, we encourage that a lot. So reach out to them, introduce yourself, be like, hey, how can I help? What can I do right now that you would need from me? Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second group that I would talk about, so for incarcerated folks, one of my favorite organizations that's working on comprehensive criminal justice reform is called the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and so their website I will post right now. EJI.org. So EJI.org, okay, I see a question. Awesome. Brother Abdullah. Yeah, the people who are incarcerated, if they are let go, they would struggle more because they won't be able to work. So what's the point? That's a great question. So there is a huge effort to sort of undo a lot of the stigma around people who have been incarcerated and a lot of the laws that are in place that prevent incarcerated people from going to work. So it is important that we pass legislation that is fully comprehensive, that attacks this issue at all sides, that not only helps people become free from prisons, but rehabilitates folks and and places folks in a place where they can actually contribute to society and they can resume their life and and move on from whatever it is that we have decided as a society to lock them up for. Um, and so, you know, I encourage you to look into that. You know, there are people who have come up with answers to that question. Um, I do not claim to be an expert on decarceration. However, I will point you to this website that has a lot of information on it, um, eji.org. The Equal Justice Initiative is committed to ending mass incarceration and excessive punishment in the United States, to challenging racial and economic justice, injustice, and to promoting basic human rights for the most vulnerable people in American society. This is straight from their website. Um, and there's a lot that they do. Um, I would encourage you guys to look into them. Also, the founder of EJI is someone that I actually have met in person. Um, there's a new Michael B. Jordan movie called Just Mercy. If you can find a way to stream it or something, uh, that might be a good quarantine movie to watch with your family. Um, it is about the founder of EJI, his journey, why he decided to do a lot of his work with incarcerated folks. I haven't seen it myself, so... <laughs> just putting it out there because I've done research on EJI, I've done research on their founder, um, Brian Stevenson, who wrote the book, Just Mercy. So please look into that. Um, and then Brother Darren here, yeah, 13th on Netflix, also very informative as well. Definitely recommend it. If you're one of my MYLP kids, you know that we watch it every year. Um, and it's, that's an amazing one as well. To, to definitely watch with your family. Um, thank you, Brother Darren. Um, the third sort of resource that I'll put out there is called feedingamerica.org. So this is for folks who are homeless, um, who might be struggling to sort of get food, <laughs> um, which is a very real anxiety that a lot of families in America actually have a large portion of American families face food insecurity. And so you can imagine with this quarantine, you know, where are folks really turning to get food? Um, I would encourage you to look at feedingamerica.org and their mission statement is Feeding America is a nationwide organization that harnesses support from local communities to the federal government, government to keep low income families supplied with food. Right now, its biggest concern is children whose schools have closed, cutting off a source of healthy, free meals. 
Feeding America has also also has a running list of food banks across the country if you'd like to donate closer to home. So, you know, like we know, um, schools are closed. And, you know, as someone who is a former youth worker, I used to do one-on-one -on -one youth work um, in, in Massachusetts. And we had a number of young people that we knew who, you know, if school was closed, they weren't going to get food. Um, and that is a reality, you know, alhamdulillah, many of the families I know, um, many of the families I know, you know, myself, many of my friends, you know, we don't deal with food insecurity. So it might not be something that you are actually even aware of unless you know someone who's dealing with it. You know, it's, it's easy to think that the rest of the world has exactly the things that you have. Um, and that's just not true. You know, we, we have certain privileges. If you are getting a meal tonight in an hour, you know, after Maghrib, like you actually comprise of a very special and privileged group of people. Um, and there are definitely families out there that will be struggling because schools are closed. Um, and because folks are getting laid off because, you know, you, they can't leave their house. So so please be mindful of that. Um, definitely log on to this website. Um, it's 6.34. I'll leave like 10-ish minutes or so for Q&A. Um, the last thing that I will say is this time, this quarantine is never going to come back. Inshallah. Um, this time that we have to be at home is something that we can really use, right? We can we can use it for a lot of different things. And I know that people are saying this, people are saying, you know, use this time to become a better person, use this time to, you know, develop a workout routine or do, you know, work on the art that you've been putting off. And all of those things need to happen. They definitely need to happen. Um, and while we do that, let's start imagining let's start dreaming let's start thinking about the society that we want to create right like what is the society that we can imagine ourselves having what does that look like and what can be done now in this moment to set us up for that right and i'll end off with a quran ayah um indeed allah will not change the condition of a people and until they change what is within themselves. Um, and so thinking a lot about our responsibility as you know, Muslims, what are we called here to do? And if we have privileges, if we are in a place of power, if we have wealth, if we have relationships, we have connections, we have time, we have a quarantine, you know, we have opportunities that have been presented to us that have been given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what are we doing with that and what will we have to answer for you know what are the different things that we've looked away from what are the whatsapp forwards that we have shared knowing deep down like oh maybe that's not right maybe you know maybe this is a generalization maybe this is something that and and you know Allahu alam like what if it is something that is just, maybe it is futile. There is no point in sh making a remark like this or a comment like this, something that you know would be hurtful. Um, how are we thinking about those things and thinking deeply about what we will have to answer for on the Day of Judgment? Um, and so with that, um, have like eight minutes. I'm going to open up for Q&A. Um, I'm also going to post the um, link to the piece of legislation that you can sign on to um, to hopefully give incarcerated folks some relief in this time of coronavirus. Um, again, it's a comprehensive bill. And so it is something that I think is useful. So I'm going to go ahead and find that. I had it open, but 
I closed it on accident. This Zoom stuff is complicated, guys. It's hard. And I feel like when we all get into the hang of it, it'll become really... Once we get into the hang of it, it's going to be like over. Coronavirus will disappear and I will no longer need my Zoom expertise. Okay, so I posted the link to the um, piece of legislation and I'm just gonna read some of the information on there. So it's from the actionnetwork.org. Take action, what a progressive response to COVID-19 looks like. Passing HD 4935, so that means it's in the House. Um, and it is Representative Connolly and Representative Honan. Um, and this is an act for providing a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures during the COVID-19 emergency. This is like families who are on the brink of foreclosures, stopping those foreclosures so people are not left homeless. Um, that is something that is obviously very important. There's a bunch of other ones. Um, paid sick time, that's incredibly important. You know, many of us might come from, again, very privileged families where we don't have to worry about those things. Maybe we're continuing to get paid, and alhamdulillah, I hope that continues to happen. But that is not the case for everyone. You know, many people are getting laid off. Many people are losing their livelihoods, and um, many people are getting sick. And so folks who are getting sick, you know, they should not be punished for that. You know, I, I feel like the sickness is punishment enough. Um, so just thinking a lot of about that. Oh, I can share the screen. <laughs> I have five minutes left. Um, so it's okay. Um, and let's see. Are, can people copy and paste that link maybe to actionnetwork.org that I posted, if folks can see that um, and just go ahead and click on it. That would be great. Um, there's a question on here about India. Can you talk about conditions in a country like India? Yeah, I mean, I don't claim to be an expert on international matters. Like, CARE is an American-based organization. Um, we work on American issues, which do impact issues all over the world. Um, but what I will say about, you know, a country like India, um, I think that folks are going to also be in a lot of trouble, <laughs> um, of course, like, just like any place across the world. Um, but certain countries do lack the infrastructure to be able to um, support those that are most in need. And so remember to keep people from all over the world in your du'as. Uh, remember to um, pray for folks. Remember to um, reach out to folks if you have family back home, you know, seeing what it is that folks need. Um, encouraging social distancing if that is possible. Um, that is something that is important. All right, I have four minutes left. Um, just looking through to see if I missed any questions. Che checking on senior neighbors and their well-being. Yep. So, I mean, there's a reason I didn't talk about senior folks and immune compromised folks. I, this is my personal opinion. I feel like I've heard a lot about it and I hope that people are taking seriously the advocacy of the elderly. Um, if you're not, I'm going to take this moment to let you know that you should. Um, you know, older folks are are like unequivocally going to be the ones who are hit the hardest. Um, and we should all know that um, at this point. My purpose in highlighting Asian Americans, incarcerated folks and homeless folks is that it's something we don't think about, right? It's a part of our society that we are just like, I guess like in the middle of all of this, we're not really thinking about it. And I want us to figure out how we can begin to think about people who are in situations that might look very different from ours. You know, if we don't identify as Asian American, maybe we are not thinking of the Asian American community, which is also part of the Muslim community, right? Like all three of these groups, Muslims are also Asian. Muslims are also incarcerated. Muslims are also homeless. There are Muslims in every three category. Um, 
And that doesn't mean, you know, there needs to be a Muslim for us to care about them. No, we should be caring about, you know, the rest of humanity. And so that was sort of my purpose and in, in not spending too much time on senior neighbors. But yes, please check on your senior neighbors. Um, any more questions? I have two more minutes. Um, I guess I'll sort of end, unless anyone has any questions, I'll end off with um, my contact information. So like I said, I work full time for care. Um, you can always reach out with any kind of questions or concerns or comments you might have. Um, my email address is s Zama, S for Samaya, S Zama at care.com. And I've posted it into the chat. I uh, will also leave my work number. Um, if you can call during work hours, you know, feel free to. Um, and that's also in the chat. Um, I'm doing a lot of work on social media. So if you are a young person who would like to submit a TikTok to care, please reach out to me um, and we can make that happen. Uh, we have our own TikTok account. We also have our own Instagram account that I'll plug. Um, so the handle is, I'm just gonna double check, Care M-A. C-A-I-R-M-A, all one word. Um, so go ahead and give us a follow. Um, reach out to me, you know, I run that account. So, you know, feel free to reach out with any ideas you have. I'm, trying to take this quarantine time to really fill that account and, and make it, inshallah, very busy. All right, Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Um, I hope you have an amazing evening and inshallah, please feel free to reach out if you need anything. Thank you, Sister Sumaya, uh, for taking your time out uh, and giving us valuable information. Jazakumullah khairan. Yeah. We're starting our evening at car with Imam Abdul Rahman in a couple of minutes, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.